So for our first presentation, uh, Michelle Jarrah McKinney is leader and founding member of Detroit Sound Conservancy and an archivist, librarian, singer, mm -hmm. and griot. She focuses on making cultural history come alive and accessible to all. Uh, she's a Detroiter and has worked in that community for over 50 years. Uh, she studied and performed African dance, folkloric music, storytelling and percussion, and worked with her late husband, Harold McKinney, and his Detroit Jazz Heritage Performance Lab, and is the founder of the women's acapella vocal and shikari group, Hakama. So today, today, she continues to gather together the community and helps express its beautiful legacies. She's gonna be talking about rehabilitating Detroit's Bluebird Inn, stoking a heart of black music and community in Detroit. So Michelle, please take it. Thank you so much, Sean, beautiful. Yes, I've worked uh, with the, uh, uh, the community. Uh, we're rehabbing the Bluebird Inn and I want to share my screen and that you see what we're working on here. So I hope that uh, you can see everything well. That uh, is the color of the Bluebird Inn, thanks to our friend Jonah, our projects uh, director. And uh, this is uh, really a, a, a mind and life changing uh, project that we're doing. Uh, our crew is the community, really. And uh, we are courting the community to get them to um, donate their collections and to work with us with the, uh, the Bluebird Inn. And the DSC, let me tell you a little bit about the DSC. It is a, uh, an archive that's devoted to the preservation and celebration of Detroit music. And we're doing it through archiving, education programs, performances, restoration initiatives. And we're trying to expand access to the history that made Detroit the most influential musical city in the world. Because Detroiters, we, we innovated techno, soul, funk, and we shaped nearly every musical genre you can think of. Punk, rap, jazz, blues, everything. So. So we have uh, this remarkable legacy that we are trying to get Detroiters to have access to, not just Detroiters, the world. And so this is um, uh, giving us a ground to do it from, this Bluebird Inn. And the Bluebird Inn is uh, one of the uh, uh, early hearths of the Black community. Uh, we were... Uh, um, kind of forced out by urban renewal out of the Black Bottom District, which the Black Bottom refers to the rich uh, river soil. And um, that's where a lot of immigrants started out from. Then they spread out further in the city. Well, Blacks weren't allowed to do that. But um, when they did the urban renewal, some of us found ourselves on the old west side. And here you see an image of the Bluebird Inn uh, with uh, 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 Joe Henderson, he's the saxophonist with the black glasses on, and he's got Kurt Lightsey on the piano and Herman Wright on bass, Roy Brooks, and I, gee, I know all these guys. And that was the past. So we're going to read, re bring that back, redo that. And on the right, you see Marion Hayden, she's on bass, Jeff Trent on flutes, and Vince Chandler on trombone. There's a uh, Corey Kendrick on keys. I know all these people. And on drums, you can't see them, but Marion's son is on the drums. So this is what we're reimagining, bringing this hearth of the neighborhood back. Across the street, you could not live across the street from here because of the restrictive covenants that were in place. And I guess I got knocked down in the 50s. And so people were able to, to live across there, but then there was the thing like the Ocean Suite. He was a doctor that bought a house very close to the, where the Bluebird Inn is. And there's a mob of like 500 people stoning the house. So it was socially not good to go over there, but it was legal. So all of that, <laughs> the Bluebird saw all of that because it was right on the dividing line where it was okay for blacks to live. And, this is very strange, but we are now, our mission now is to engage and educate our community to honor its musical legacy, even though in the past it hasn't been 
um, Blacks have been kind of missing in action in a lot of the repositories in Detroit and in Michigan and probably across the United States. So we've uh, engaged the community and we've centered around special collections like the Club Heavens. Uh, the Club Heaven was where um, there was a gay presence. The, the gay community was were there and techno and electronic music was, was celebrated there because it, it, right from disco to house to techno. And then you have um, the Detroit Sound Hall of Fame, which uh, there's a Detroit, the historic Bluebird Inn stage. We have where we got collections from the Greystone Ballroom, which was celebrated by the uh, Greystone International Jazz Museum. And we have United Sound Studio items and thousands of artifacts. So here you see we're doing a community engagement here with Marion Hayden and Sean, uh, uh, Deshaun Jackson in front of the Bluebird Inn and the neighbors are coming by and, and checking out some live jazz. It's, it's just really such a, a, a cool place. And so the, our goals are preservation, to uh, acquire and get the trust of the people to get these things to preserve them. And we're cataloging and curating these historical artifacts. And we're doing a lot of oral histories. Uh, there's a lot, the oral histories help fill holes that you know, people haven't been writing and doing scholarly journals about that music scene. So we're trying to fill that hole with oral histories for the uh, a past and hopefully get people interested enough to do a future, have a future. So we're doing education stuff. We're having conferences. Uh, we're mentoring students and scholars, tourists. We're doing bus tours. We're trying to raise awareness of this community of musicians and uh, music performances that are going on in Detroit. Um, we're, we're establishing performances in parks and things around in the area. Uh, and we're trying to incubate this musical talent. Uh, Detroit is chock full of musical talent and we want them to have a place they can come to to rehearse or to learn more about it or meet some of the master musicians and do that great Detroit mentoring thing. So that's one of our goals is also to up that performance and placekeeping, of course, is us having a place for people to come to and to be together and, and be, be and, you know, bring back that social element that Bluebird was famous for in the past. And there is a, our board there. Some of the people are actually deceased now. That gentleman way in the back in the end with the blue hat, that's, uh, that's, uh, the nephew of the person who owned it, that's Jimmy, Jimmy Lee, uh, Lee Simmons. And Lee Simmons, uh, he passed away from COVID, unfortunately. But uh, this, we have, uh, it's interracial. It's uh, just a very beautiful board. I mean, these people have some really good souls and they're all passionate about uh, keeping this Bluebird in going. And there we are all together. <laughs> it's just really wonderful that this community has just put their arms around us. And it's uh, all kinds of people, musicians, DJs, songwriters, historic preservation people, uh, archivists like me, information science people, musicologists, historians. I mean, we have a whole slew of, of professions um, and then they're in these people that you see right there. And so uh, we uh, had to move out of the, uh, um, we had to move out of the, uh, the I'm trying to think of uh, the storage space. And we, uh, this is uh, us doing a, a um, at, the, at the historical museum, we're doing a, an exhibit and we're getting volunteers to come and doing some archiving work there. So we, our volunteers have really helped a lot and we got a grant from the Mellon, which has helped us too. And all of this uh, is done now from the historic WGPR, which is the uh, uh, place where we're living now. That's our, that's, uh, well, it looks a little different now because we're still working in there. But uh, GPR was one of the first television stations in the country that believe it or not, Nixon helped us get helped us uh, create. <laughs> he did something good, and uh, uh, we had a TV and a radio station there. And now it is only a radio station. Um, and the uh, popular shows back there, I remember watching the scene and uh, Big City News. 
on GPR. And we were so proud. We are so proud of it because it was like uh, the first place where you could see people who looked like you on television. So that was a really great place. And they have uh, one of our board members, Karen Hudson Samuels. She got us a, a, a room, a couple of rooms in there. And so we now are out of the storage and we are actually doing our processing and um, uh, our work that we're working on now to rehab the Bluebird. We're, we're doing it from here. And so this is our future, the Bluebird Inn the birthplace of bebop jazz. And it was a heart for the black community in the Detroit back then was a very social place. Uh, they took care of the kids who were interested and showed an interest in jazz and they brought them and you could go, they could go into the bars and, and uh, learn from the musicians who would take them under their wing. And this is one of the places that that was done in. So we're poised to rehab this historic building. We've just uh, got a roof on and we are now in the process of doing the insides. So this is a map to show where we are. This is like mid Detroit. And like I told you, if you look down uh, where it says 48210, that was the white area and 48204 and 48206. Am I in the right direction here? Let's see what word, yes. And so Bluebird was a dividing line. The, I mean, Tyerman Avenue was a dividing line. And that was, uh, and we were right, it was right on that line. And if you look to at this, you can see in the past on the left was uh, where you see that little dark L with all those spots. That was, that was the, uh, the uh, uh, black bottom area. And you can see that the, in the red circle on the left, it was not that many people, but, 10 years down the road, so many people were coming up from down south that uh, it really got really overcrowded. It was, it was uh, really a hard spot and we weren't allowed to go any place else in the city. So you can see how we were so congested. Then when the expressway came in, all of us had to go uh, to other spots and that's when other spots were kind of forced to open up to us. So that we were talking about Paradise Valley, which was the black downtown. And, and then the uh, street uh, in the old west side became the black, the, uh, the black downtown. Uh, Miller, Miller, I think, let's see, what is his name? Milford, that's the name of it. So this is a wonderful storyteller here, Catherine Blackwell. Uh, she tells, she told the story, she's, she's deceased now, but she told the story about the Nacarima Club, which is American spelled backwards. And that was, that's our sister uh, club uh, a few blocks away from us. And um, that was where the black servicemen were able to go and relax and have actually have a club. They had dances. Um, it was a, a very uh, warm uh, neighborhood. There were judges living next to factory workers, living next to their students, the teachers. I mean, everybody was in that same place, that same area. So that, that was a very wonderful area. We had to have our own businesses because of segregation in the city. So this was a very vibrant, thriving neighborhood. And the, the Bluebird Inn was one of the gathering places in that neighborhood. And there's a historic timeline. It was built in the 20s. Uh, by the 40s, we had music in there and there was a house band that, that got put in there. Um, uh, 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 1948 it began the, the bebop, which is a listening kind of music, and the bluebird was perfect. It's a little shoebox, but you can it, you can sit and hear. It has some of the best acoustics in the city, uh, and this was according to one of the professors who works at Michigan State University. He played there. He's a bass player, uh, Rodney Whitaker, and Professor Whitaker was saying that this was one of the most perfectly acoustic uh, clubs in the city. Well, it went down in the 70s uh, because of, of well, various things. Uh, people didn't like having to pay to come see people. They were used to just walking in to the Bluebird. And so that had to change. And then Clarence and Mary Edmonds passed away and they had to close their doors in the 2003. So here's the, so the, some, some of the sonic significance of the place, it was, uh, uh, great musicians coming by, like um, 
Miles Davis and Charlie Parker and uh, Sonny Stitt and, and a lot of the local musicians like Roy Brooks, who you saw on the slide before playing drums. And uh, he's now a Kresge eminent artist, Wendell Harrison, who there was a, a, a Northwestern high school which had a jazz band there. And Wendell apprenticed at the Bluebird playing jazz. That's where he learned it. And Motown is like uh, half a mile down the road from us. I mean, uh, this all of this great creative music was happening in this one area of the city. I mean, it was it was, it was like say, an institute, a haven for jazz. So in the 40s and 50s, that was the heyday. It started to go down in the 60s. Yeah, here are some more of the wonderful musicians, some of the pictures of their sets. And that's the Bluebird stage that we have reconditioned. They're on the stage. It's a little tiny stage. Yeah, there, there they are. I think that's Roy Brooks on the drums in this picture. There's Miles. Uh, Cannonball Adderley is standing behind Miles. And there's uh, John Coltrane to the right. Yes, it, it was uh, heavy hitters. So you can see that it was, uh, the community was there. They're throwing maybe some kind of dance over there to the right. I mean, that place was chock full of people, okay? It was a serious uh, hearth. And then they are enjoying themselves. So DSC got into the picture in 2012. It is our 10th year anniversary. And um, these are the, the the crew that was there. There's Carlton Goltz and Denise Dalfon and uh, all all my lovelies. <laughs> and so uh, what, this is our first meetup outside. And there they uh, went in, got permission to go in and save the stage because the the roof was leaking, and they were able to rebuild it. So there you see the archaeologists have gone in a class from Wayne State University. They came in and helped with that. And there they are, <laughs> tools in hand, <laughs> salvaging the historic stage. And so now it's in perfect condition. This is them working on it. Oh, there's me standing on the salvage stage, <laughs> doing a lecture. <laughs> and um, the neighbors came together also. We purchased the building. And uh, these are conferences that we gave and we raised money and we got this, uh, um, we, got the, we got the building. This is us doing the inside. As you can see how it started and then at the last, uh, you can see that it's got cleaned up very much. That's pretty much how it looks now. And so we got it voted in 2020 as a local historic district. And we replaced the roof last year oh boy that was a that was a, a bootstrap lift <laughs> see the beautiful roof on the right and so uh, we're trying to get this present preserved and um we're going to put our archives in there some of the stuff from the wgpr we're going to move over there when we get it fixed up uh, it's going to be accessible to the neighbors uh, there's going to be creative innovation opportunities and live music performances and we're doing all kinds of cultural expressions that, and media making that's actually coming from the neighborhood around there. So it's gonna be intergenerational. We're right across the street from a, a middle school. And so we're gonna uh, do after school programming and in school programming. I'm gonna get them interested in Michigan History Day and get them to use our collections to present. Uh, we're having heritage education. A lot of these children don't know anything about jazz or even what a record is. <laughs> they don't know what a tape recorder is. We're going to teach them about that and how to go into their families and, and also do some archiving and maybe doing deposits at the, at the archives. So it's going to be a beautiful thing. And this is what it used to, this is what it looks like now, actually where you can see the stage was, uh, it used to be in that front corner near the front entry, near the top of the screen there, but it moved to the back there where it is now in this picture. And uh, we had, they had booths along the side there and the bar was uh, projected out and it had the speakers in it. It was a, quite a, a, a cozy hookup. And this is what our, 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 um, our, um, 
uh, architects have put together. We're going to have an open uh, window up here at the top so that people can get ice cream and food right out to the window there. The bar is going to still be in the same spot. We're going to have a flexible seating area. The archive and a green room will be over here at the top in the middle there. The stage is going to be where it was. And then we have the uh, uh, all the rest of the parking. And we're going to build an addition on the back for the uh, for the. Uh, OK, I got it. All right. So um, this is pretty much what you know it's going to look like. And uh, we're hoping that the neighbors will come on back. The architects uh, pictures of what it's going to be like. And so to get involved with us, we hope that you will come and help us, um, you know, and donate and secure the Bluebird as our future home. And you can give at DetroitSound.org slash give slash bird and maybe take a picture of this little doohickey on the screen and come in, come and help us. And you can volunteer and just visit us at Detroit Sound. And thank you for listening. All right, thank you, Michelle. So we uh, have time for a few questions here. Um, if you have a question, please put that in the Q&A area um, and uh, we'll, we'll get to it. We have uh, an initial question. Uh, Andrew Klein, very interested in building materials. Um, um, building like materials. It. Yeah, so some of the elements that um, historic preservationists were really paying yeah. attention to there when trying to get that authentic historic look. Yeah, we, we're, um, in, we're in um, conversation with uh, the historic uh, office and we have to keep that blue. <laughs> and so anything on the outside, um, that is in that this view on the that is in view ex, in the exterior. So we're keeping we're being very careful to keep that together. And um, we had to fool around and get that roof uh, done real quick. And uh, I guess that got overlooked talking to the historic people. But they said since you couldn't see it, it's on the exterior. It was it was okay. So we got the joists replaced and all that. That was a chore, but. That's we were we we are in contact with the historic commission. Yeah, I wonder if you could say a little bit more. People are always curious about uh, funding, right? Um, so this is local yeah. history, and you got a national grant here, right? So what what was the strategy there in making the argument, right, for the importance of the local? I think because it was uh, so many. Um, jazz stars that came through there. I mean, it was Miles Davis. I mean, he as that was actually his home. He came to Detroit to dry out, I guess. <laughs> and so uh, the I think the name the name dropping really helped. And uh, the the thing was is that um, Detroit music is so important to Detroit. I think that helped too with the funding on the national level. And that the Mellon grant really helped uh, drive other uh, grants to us. Kresge helped too. Uh, so between uh, Kresge and the Mellon, those two grants, it's almost like pulling the cork out, the, uh, the genie came out of the bottle. <laughs> so that made it easier to raise other money. But we are still hoping, keep our fingers crossed for us because we have two major grants coming in now that will help uh, with the uh, inside, the heating and cooling, the floors, the doors, the walls, you know, that that's the, our next uh, phase that we're, we're getting to. So that that funding really was, was uh, the grant really helped, the grants really helped. Yes, yeah, success begets success, right? Yes. Um, I, I'm curious while people are posting additional questions, my, my other, I was really taken by your point about having a place was the phrase that you, you used, right? And that plays out at multiple levels here, right? Because you were talking about the importance of the bluebird as a place. Um, you're taking your collections outside of the, the archive, right? Into the classroom, into the bluebird. Um, but you also mentioned that you're, you're back in WGPR. And I wondered if you could say a little bit more about that 
place and how you plan to use that, how other people are using that place when they come in and use your collections there? Well, we're actually, we don't have uh, people coming in using the collections right now. Um, and that's, that's been the, you know, the hope to get the Bluebird up as fast as possible. And a lot of our collections are also available online right now because they've been digitized. So you can go to DetroitSound.org and you can see all, with all the artifacts that we have. There's oral histories there, there's images. I mean, there's a lot of our collection has been digitized. Not a lot of it, but um, a lot of the stuff from the Greystone, it was easily, we salvaged that from another building that was had a roof leak. We're, we are, we, we, we're in the salvage business, <laughs> but uh, we were able to uh, digitize a lot of that stuff as we took it in. So there's, there's radio shows uh, that are online. Uh, I, I showed some of the oral histories that we had this morning, uh, earlier in a session this morning at ARSC. And I'm telling you, there is a lot of stuff to fall in love with on that site. So that's where our, our, our we're getting our access that way right now but the WGPR spot is more still just a processing site and we're preparing for the bluebird when it finally uh, opens up as our home so that's and so we're 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 still working on those collections making them into archival collections that's what we're doing at GPR and we're and I'm pretty sure we I, I hope we'll be able to keep it you know to and the, 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 the station has been really lovely to us. They've been helping us very much. Yeah, I think this uh, project is a great example of uh, strategies for, for activating archives, right? For really doing something with your, your collections and moving them. Yeah, we're the advocating community. too. Uh, I hope that you, uh, everyone here will go and check out the, uh, the, the, what, we're, what we've been advocating for with the uh, United Sound Studios. You know, that's gonna be this Saturday, uh, May 21st at one at ARSC and it is a panel with uh, a lot of the uh, activists from the Detroit Sound Conservancy. So we're not only working on our building, we're advocating for all. That's why that placekeeping really is seriously part of our mission. So I, like I that. love placekeeping. Placekeeping yes. is a nice way of putting that. Yeah. Yes. It, yeah that provides we... access. <laughs> And we've got links to everything you were mentioning that have come up in the, oh, the chat so people can check that out. Um, Thank you. Yeah, yeah so we need I your help. That... <laughs> help. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Michelle. I think it's a good point to transition here to our, our next um, uh, presentation. Yeah, thank you for the talk. 